you know, I've talked over and over again about the risk of eating too much red meat. But if you still want your steak, so be it. But not all steak is created equal. So when you're at the store and you're buying your steak to go home and cook, or even if you're at a restaurant, you have to know what to look for and what to avoid. And that's why I'm here. And I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, the beef state. And let me tell you, I know beef. In fact, believe it or not, our high school prom were always held at the Omaha Stockyards. No kidding. So beef is my middle name and beef is my game. So you want to eat steak? First of all, look for grass-fed and grass-finished beef. Now, we love the idea of corn feeding our beef, our cows. Why? Because that corn-fed beef is marbled with that succulent, delicious fat that gives us the mouthfeel that we're, we associate with a great tasting steak. And it makes the steak incredibly tender. But here's the problem. Corn is just pure omega-6 inflammatory fats. Now traditionally, cows that are fed on grass have in their fat an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of anywhere from three to five omega-6 parts to one part omega-3 fat. And that's a natural ratio. When we add corn to the mix, that ratio can go up to 25 to 50 to one instead of the three to five that we're looking for. So that juicy, tender, mouth-watering steak becomes an inflammatory fat nightmare. Those fats actually increasingly are becoming realizing as one of the biggest drivers of inflammation in our country particularly. They turn into compounds called aldehydes. One aldehyde that you're probably aware of is formaldehyde, the things that we preserve bodies with. I spent a lot of time in, around formaldehyde in medical school, and I assure you, you don't want to eat a steak that turns to formaldehyde in your body. And yet, that's exactly what it does. Now, the problem with marbling, and actually the problem with grass-fed, is there's actually no law, no federal law, that tells you what grass-fed means. Technically, all cows eat grass for some part of their life. If you then feed them grass for even one day, as an example, and then take them to the feedlot and give them corn and soybeans for the rest of their lives, legally, there's nothing to stop the company from telling this is grass-fed beef. What good producers will do is they'll feed them for grass most of their lives, but then to give you the mouthfeel you're looking for, they'll take them to the feedlot and feed them corn and soybeans or corn only for about six weeks to fatten them up for slaughter and to give you that mouthfeel. The way around that is to look for grass-fed and grass-finished beef. Now you'll see it in some of the high-end markets. You can certainly find it on the internet. But if you're going to have your beef, that's what you're looking for because it's going to have much better proper ratios of omega-6 to omega-3. So labeling is really deceptive. And if you have any doubt, contact the company and ask what they do. Now, I'm old enough to remember that back in the old days, even in Nebraska, Meats, beef was very expensive, and they certainly weren't an everyday thing. And cheaper cuts were what the average person could afford, like a chuck steak or a round steak. 
They were cheap because they had a lot of gristle. And that gristle is actually where gelatin and collagen come from. And it turns out our microbiome actually loves to ferment the gristle and does not ferment muscle as well. So inadvertently, poor people, people who couldn't afford a lot of meat, and long-lived people in general, were eating these old, tough cuts of meat, and they weren't eating very much of it. And they were doing one other thing that I think that's particularly illustrative of how we ought to approach beef, lamb, and pork in general. So they cooked them all day long. My mother would cook a pot roast all day long for us. And we'd have it actually multiple days. And that gristle would break down. And unbeknownst to us, we were actually having gelatin and collagen on almost a daily basis in these meats. We also actually benefited from gelatin almost every day in the form of jello. Now, jello is not a health food, folks, but believe it or not, almost every day of our lives, we were having gelatin in the form of jello. Now, don't rush out and buy jello. There's lots of easier ways to get gelatin into your life. But the point is, we were also having a soup in those days called consomme. And in fancy restaurants, you even had chilled consomme as an appetizer. And consomme was simply high-end bone broth. Now, don't rush out and buy bone broth, because bone broth, the arsenic and lead in bones is actually remarkably high. So be careful when you're eating steaks. And for goodness sakes, please, please, please avoid the steaks that have all the marbling. You're much safer to have a filet that's grass-fed, grass-finished than a ribeye, even if it's grass-fed, grass-finished, because it's going to have much less of the harmful fats. Now, something that I've been researching for my upcoming book, and something I research in going to countries like Portugal, like Spain, like France, like Italy, is that these people, particularly the poor parts of these countries, use a lot of sausages, fermented meats in their diet. In fact, the country with the longest lifespan is actually a tiny country between France and Spain called Andorra. Andorians have a lifespan of 87.7 years. Pretty spectacular. And Andorians do two things. They eat sausages every day. Now these are fermented sausages. People are poor and they can't waste animals. So they go, they eat everything the saying is from snout to tail. But to preserve these foods, they actually grind them up and make sausages. And the sausages are preserved by fermentation. The fermentation does a lot of really cool things that you'll hear about in the upcoming book. But among other things, just to tease you, fermentation makes these incredible mitochondrial uncouplers, polyamines. And polyamines promote longevity in multiple ways. The other thing that it does is it breaks down some of the really health-destroying compounds that I write about in beef, lamb, and pork called NU5GC. So these folks, because they were poor, actually got tremendous health benefits by fermenting their beef products. So sausages traditionally prepared from Italy, from Spain, from France, from Portugal, are actually pretty doggone good health foods. 
But that doesn't mean you can go to the grocery store and say, hi, I want a pound of sausage meat or fresh sausage and think you're going to get the same benefit. Au contraire, these are not properly prepared and they will do you more harm than good. All right, so if you want to have your meat, have it, but in moderation, of course. Fill your plate with vegetables and make meat the garnish. You should also try to decrease your consumption of meat for many reasons that you'll learn about in the new book. But if you want to treat yourself to a steak every once in a while, I get it. When my wife and I have a steak, we buy a filet and we split it. And we get the flavor we want, but we're not killing ourselves in the process. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dr. Gundry podcast. Make sure you check this one out too. It turns out that fish consumption is also associated with an overall bigger brain size and a bigger hippocampus, the memory centers of our brain. 